Welcome to the debate on Press TV. Uh, we're coming to you from our headquarters in Tehran. I'm your host, Behrouz Najafi. The Syrian envoy to the United Nations has criticized the Security Council being used as a tool to serve Western countries' political agenda. Bashar al-Jafari slammed what it called the Council's inaction against occupation of Syrian territory. He called Washington and Ankara as occupiers of northern Syria. The Iranian UN envoy has also warned of Washington's secret agenda in Syria, urging U.S. forces to evacuate. He also condemned the U.S. unilateral sanctions on Damascus. Now, let's go to Syria. Our correspondent, uh, Mohammed Ali, is there for us. Let's see what he has for us. Mohammed, over to you. Yes, uh, Syria's permanent representative at the United Nations, Dr. Bashar al-Jafari, said in his uh, latest uh, word before the UN Security Council, he actually focused that word on uh, what he described as the UN Security Council's uh, failure uh, for decades in addressing many issues that threaten international peace and uh, security in the region and in the world, uh, mainly the Israeli occupation of Arab lands uh, in Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon, uh, the US-British invasion of uh, Iraq, and NATO's destruction of Libya. Now, Regards, regarding Syria, al jafari said that after 10 years of the UN Security Council's intervention in discussing the situation uh, in Syria, he said, and I quote, we still see U.S. occupation in, in northeastern Syria, U.S. support to terrorist uh, uh, groups uh, and separatist militias, meaning the uh, so-called SDF, as well as U.S. occupation of al tent area and al rukban uh, camp, in addition to the U.S. Uh, support to Daesh and the so-called Malawir al tawra terrorist groups. Uh, he also noted that there is still Turkish occupation uh, uh, in areas areas uh, north and north and northwestern Syria and that uh, whereas Turkey there supports and recruits mercenaries using them as he described uh, in the market of international wars he also said that we still witness Turkey's war crimes against Syrians such as killings displacement uh, looting and depriving Syrians of drinking water Jafari also stressed that in addition to all that in southern Syria we also continue to see the Israeli occupation uh, mm -hmm. al jafari made it clear that Western member states of the UN Security Council did not do anything to enable that council to fulfill its commitments and tasks to end the U.S., uh, uh, Israeli, and Turkish occupation of Syrian lands, and that all those Western uh, uh, states did was that they only fueled the crisis in Syria, prolonged it, and further complicated it, turning the council into a tool in service of their political agendas. All right, thank you for that. Mohamed Ali, press TV correspondent in Damascus, Syria. Let me invite author and activist with International Action Center, Sarah Flounders uh, from New York. Good to have you with us, uh, ma'am. Uh, the United States and uh, Turkey have not been invited by the Damascus government to go to Syria. And Damascus regards their presence as illegal in occupation. What's the U.S. doing there? Well, the U.S. from the very beginning uh, has been attempting a regime change operation, in other words, a completely illegal pull down of the Syrian elected government and a destruction of Syria. Uh, they have really sought since 2003, there have been U.S. sanctions on Syria and beginning now, it's going into the 10th year, U.S. intervention through mercenary forces, through bombings, through troops of occupation, every effort to overturn the government of Syria. And it is a criminal operation, every single aspect of it. Okay, now from London, uh, I'm also joined by Secretary General of the Next Century Foundation, uh, William Morris. Uh, William, the Pentagon says that U.S. forces are protecting the fields and facilities from possible Daesh attacks, ignoring what President Trump said a bit before that, that Washington was seeking economic interest in controlling Syrian oil fields. Let's have your take. Well, the U.S. is scarcely relevant with regard to Syria now, is it? I mean, it, it has very little uh, role. The problem more is, is to do with, um, I suppose, its main role is in imposing sanctions. Uh, its troops are down to minimum. Uh, they're over by the Iraq border. The real worry is Turkey and Turkey's incursions. Turkey is the big beast as far as Syria is concerned. It's causing a lot of problems and particular problems for the people of northern Syria. Of course, uh, Idlib is miserable. That whole area is miserable and living in misery. And uh, uh, because, because there is this problem between 
Turkey, Syria, and the Islamist fighters that are there, um, many of whom are, of course, backed by Turkey and supported by Turkey. There, there are big problems within northern Syria, and I presume that uh, there will be a major onslaught before the, by the Syrian government to, to try and clear, clean up Idlib by the, before the... Um, before the presidential elections next, well, they're delayed, I think, from May to June, but anyway, next June, if that's when they're held. Um, meanwhile, the fiasco of the negotiations in Geneva over a putative constitution rumble on, uh, with everybody spiking it. Um, it really is a, a joke, the UN-sponsored negotiations in Geneva. The Syrian government delays everything as best it can, and and meanwhile the 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 rump members of the opposition in Geneva that are representing the Syrian opposition and they scarcely represent anything are too busy drinking booze and caviar, eating caviar and living it up, and they run the the discussions go on and on and on and they have another round and another round there'll be another round they'll get nowhere and they'll be irrelevant mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, a particular joke but um, no in in many ways Syria is much stable the, the the main part of Syria if you discount the extreme north is is mm -hmm. stable and is doing quite well you have these ridiculous uh, Israeli air raids which are just Israel trying to score points uh, while Trump is still president because they realize they'll they'll have to be a little quieter perhaps with the incoming US president who may not have the same may not give them the same carte blanche as as Trump did uh, but um, but no things in in Syria if you discount the north and if you discount these stupid uh, pointless air raids by there was one recently just south of Damascus on uh, allegedly on some Iranian troops allegedly in response to an attempt to break through the the border fence on the Golan I mean um, if there was an attempt to break through the border fence by some Golanis they get so many uh, they have such a mm -hmm. miserable time they're divided by that border fence aren't they so so they have that uh, they have that yeah. A sadness, and uh, I'm sure there might have been some incident, but it's it's kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's just an excuse. Sorry, no. and, and no, but they're, 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 that's my take on the situation at present. Okay. Now, of course, we're discussing the uh, northern part of uh, Syria, where the U.S. and Turkish forces are present. Uh, uh, Sarah, uh, President Trump said in October last year that practically, I'm quoting him, that practically we are out of Syria. The troops are there to quote secure the oil. Is that what they're doing? We have reports of, you know, just last week, 30 tankers, you know, carrying crude oil to Iraq, uh, U.S. actual forces. So are U.S. forces uh, guarding the Syrian crude as President uh, Trump is claiming? We're plundering Syrian resources. Well, from the very beginning, this has been about plundering the Syrian resources. And could they uh, completely overturn, collapse the government, uh, set up uh, their own government, that was the aim. That aim did not succeed because the level of Syrian resistance on every measure has just been incredible. Ten years of the most difficult, difficult resistance and fighting tens of thousands of U.S. and Turkish and Saudi armed mercenaries, militias. Uh, it's really been an incredible U.S. bombing. Uh, supposedly against uh, Daesh ISIS forces, but really again, to completely destroy as much as they could of uh, Syrian infrastructure. Uh, from the beginning, U.S. policy has been how much damage can they do and how much can they lay hold of uh, in a complete act of piracy. Now, Trump was right up front uh, in saying that U.S. interest is in the oil fields. Mm -hmm. U.S. interest has never been in the people of Syria, never been, of course, in human rights or democracy. It's been in oil and in the control. It's not that Syria wasn't making the oil available on world markets. It's, it's that the U.S. wants to control uh, the market and, and actually break up also not only Syria, but the entire region. 
and that is the in every sense the the united states has played a role in how to destabilize not only syria but continue the occupation of palestine do as much damage and disorganization as they possibly can in lebanon continue to threaten iran this is us policy continue the occupation mm -hmm. uh in iraq and northern iraq uh so the troops have been moved back and forth in and out uh, along with thousands and tens of thousands of contractors and mercenaries uh mm -hmm. every part of it and with uh nato su uh, support turkey is a member of nato for 70 years and still acts with a certain level of coordination although they have their own interests and aims in this also completely criminal piracy and looting so i i think it's important to really salute the level of syrian resistance uh by the government by the people uh by an organized cohesive force that continued to feed the population of syria that continued to provide medical uh, relief. Uh, in my travels to Syria, I was really amazed, impressed by the level of cohesion, even in wartime, that continued in Syria. Mm -hmm. And it's now, Syria is rebuilding in whole parts of Syria, but it's made more difficult because the sanctions continue to bite deep. They stop any country from uh, just providing basic basic uh, rebuilding material. And that's another crime. We have mm -hmm. to uh, acknowledge that as much damage as any other country is doing, the greatest damage comes from uh, U.S. power and coordination to try to damage Syria and continue to extract a heavy price. Now, we got a demand of this new administration. They say they're different. They got to prove it. They got to prove it to the people of the world, to the people of Syria, and right here to the people in the U.S. Right. If they're different, they got to act different. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, William, uh, Sarah talked about uh, what the U.S. is doing in uh, northern Syria. What about Turkey now? What's Ankara's agenda behind maintaining military presence in northern Syria? Well, I'll just take issue with Sarah slightly. I mean, um, I'm sure we agree with regard to Turkey. With regard to the United States of America, United States of America, I mean, <laughs> doesn't want serious assets. Okay, Trump may come out with lines like that, but they, they are so piffling, they're so small, the oil resources you're talking about are so trivial that they are really irrelevant to a world in which uh, oil is, which is becoming fast less oil dependent. And Syria still has to depend on Iranian subsidies, and it, it's not this is really not what America's policy is about. America's policy was about destabilizing Bashar al-Assad. But I don't think anybody in the world really cares that much about Syrian oil. If you're talking, the Kurds care a lot about it, and they are trying to export a little, and they've got a U.S. company uh, buying it. And yes, the U.S., the piffling levels of troops that are left by the U.S., and the U.S. has really abandoned the Syrian Kurds and abandon northern Syria. Uh, and the Syrian Kurds were helping them in the fight against Daesh. They left them to, the, the, to become victims of Turkey. And Turkey has been the brute on the block and has been quite ruthless in regard to, yes, to, in regard to the Syrian Kurds. So the Syrian Kurds are now seeking a, a kind of accommodation with uh, Bashar al-Assad's government and mm -hmm. very eagerly doing so and are uh, being well received and there are talks in place and I'm sure the oil issue will be resolved uh, between the Syrian Kurds and Bashar al-Assad's government. But, the, um, but as regards Turkey, Turkey's behavior is, is beyond, I mean it is, it is so disturbing and of course it's partly a Turkish fear it's based on fear, this kind of, well, partly fear, fear of the, their own Kurdish minority. And so they don't want to see a successful uh, Kurdish area of northern Syria uh, because it, it means that their own Kurdish minority will turn around and say, what about us? Mm -hmm. And they are repressed. I mean, you, 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 many of them live under curfew. They have a very difficult time. In, in Turkish, uh, the Kurdish areas of Turkey. Mm -hmm. So 
we really have a lot to uh, question Erdogan of Turkey about, and he is becoming an adventurist not just in Syria, but in in Libya too, and to all over the place. He's he Mediterranean. Becoming, uh, helps him distract the the his own population from their own troubles mm -hmm. if he can divert them with foreign adventures. And in, in a sense, that's the other reason for Turkey's involvement in northern Syria. It distracts okay. his p local population from their own troubles at home, and mm -hmm. they have a few. Okay. Now, uh, Sarah, do you share the Syrian uh, UN envoy's argument? He says that the UN Security Council has turned into a tool to serve the political agenda of a number of Western states. Well, I don't know if it's been turned into or it has always been a tool of U.S. and E.U. Western interests. And it has functioned both through its resolutions, through its vetoes, through its U.N.-imposed sanctions. In every single way has functioned against the interests of the people of the world and again and again against the interests of peace. And when, when the U.S. Um, policymakers are able to use the U.N. Security Council, they do so. And when they want to ignore it because they can't get a vote through, they ignore it. Uh, mm -hmm. But certainly in all of this, the U.N. Security Council uh, has, has uh, operated with complete uh, connivance uh, from both Washington and from the EU. Uh, that is a real problem, and uh, it's very important that uh, uh, Bashar al-Jafari uh, raises this because he is the uh, Syrian representative to the UN, so he speaks with great authority, knowing again and again the efforts of Syria to make their case to the UN Security Council and how it ha there's been a deaf ear turned consciously, mm -hmm. consciously. Uh, also, just to say with the, uh, to the other speaker, I, I do agree that this is not just a war for oil, that serious oil is not of any great uh, amount. Uh, and it is primarily a war to destabilize and to try to assert uh, U.S. dominance in the entire region mm -hmm. uh, it's because Syria also defended the Palestinian people and defended the interests of the people of Syria, that Syria was targeted mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we want to, every war, every U.S. war is not for oil. Uh, the U.S. has blockaded and uh, Cuba for years. Cuba has no oil and no mm -hmm. great resources, but is determined to have its own independent policy and develop the country in the interests of the Cuban people. Now, this is also true in Syria. That determination to build uh, a multinational, multi-religious, a mosaic of all the people of Syria for the benefit of the Syrian people and to use the resources for that. Syria accomplished great things. They had the highest educational and health standards in the entire region before this war. Mm -hmm. And this war has literally left, uh, I think, a quarter of the population uprooted uh, as, as both migrants internally and outside of Syria. That right. is a horrendous toll. And it's, it's a toll that is how to create havoc. Uh, it was uh, every single U.S. war is never about construction. It's always about destruction. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. So i got one question for both of you. Uh, William, you talked about uh, Israeli uh, aggression against Syria in uh, Golan Heights. Tell us what Israel is uh, doing there in northern Syria. In one minute, please. <laughs> it's just a taking advantage of the last moments of a Trump presidency. Uh, they are slightly nervous about the incoming president-elect Biden, Joe Biden. And uh, of course, he's very pro-Israeli. He describes himself as pro-Israel and pro-Israel's interests, but he, uh, he is, he's a different kind of character from Donald Trump, who, is, who was um, almost, <laughs> you could regard him as Israel's man in Washington. Donald Trump was, has been very extraordinary. Uh, now, Biden's not going to take back the, 
the em embassy from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv or do anything of that kind. He is mm -hmm. very pro-Israel, but he isn't as uh, as blanket uh, uh, an actor as as Trump has been. Okay. And so Israel's taking taking this advantage of this mm -hmm. moment to score a few points while it can. Right. Uh, okay, Sarah, go ahead, please. Well, I. I think uh, Golan has been occupied now, you know, uh, more than 50 years through mm -hmm. Democratic and Republican administrations and the U.S. funding, arming in, in astronomical ways the Israeli occupation of Palestine, of Golan, both. Mm -hmm. So will there be any change with the Biden administration? There will be a change in uh, the conduct that does not mean in the policy. Uh -huh. uh, Biden will have a different face than the Trump administration. That's true. Right. Uh, and important, Trump was defeated. That's true. But it's up to the population here and around the world to demand different right. of a Biden administration. Okay, thank you so much for your contribution and insight. We had Secretary General of the Next Century Foundation, William Morris from London an author, activist, and it, with the International Action Center, Sarah Flanders, who joined us from New York. And thank you for watching this edition of the debate on Press TV. I've been your host, Behruz Najafi, and I'll see you next time.